Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here with us today, and uh, we hope and pray that this will be a service that uh, glorifies God and draws all of our hearts closer to Him. So, uh, just a few announcements to make sure that you're aware of for the other activities at the church as uh, the fall begins. Um, the men's Bible study is happening on Tuesdays now. It's going to be at uh, my house this week instead of Pastor Dan's. Uh, so take note of that if you're part of the men's study. We'd love to see you there. Uh, the uh, Billy Graham Evangelical Evangelistic Association uh, are doing prayer walks again. Uh, we talked about it a little bit last week. If you want more information about that, talk to Pastor Dan. Uh, that's just a sponsored thing where you go and you do prayer walks in your city so that uh, we can see change in our city. kind of goes along with our 40 days of prayer stuff. Uh, that we were doing a few months ago. And again, I want to remind you, we're going to be doing a Thanksgiving booklet for the month of, uh, not August, October. Uh, that is the right sound. And uh, we would love it if any of you would like to send in a, a devotional or a day that we could do Thanksgiving for, something that you're thankful for, uh, then how to pray about that thing, uh, being thankful for it, uh, then how can you give based on that thing, what's a, a service that you can do. And uh, so if you have any questions about that, you want to see a sample, let me know. Uh, we're going to make Wednesday the deadline if you want to send in a Thanksgiving page so that we can have the booklet together so that we can give it to people next Sunday because then the following, I think, Friday, if I have my days right, is the first one of October. That's when we would be starting with it. So uh, that's pretty crazy that October's almost upon us. Um, other than that, uh, we have an anniversary card for the Rosimoviches in the foyer. Uh, that's an encouragement for uh, them, uh, especially for Edith, who is in Germany, uh, seeking medical help there. We thought we would uh, get people from the church. If you want, you can sign it on your way out and uh, just sign your names or a little encouragement or thinking of you, that sort of thing, and uh, we will send it off to them. Uh, and then finally, the... A WANA program started up on Wednesday. We had a great first evening with 24 kids. Uh, and we know of a few more who we think will be coming as well. Uh, there is still room for you to volunteer if you would like to. Uh, we could still use a few extra hands, uh, always. And, uh, but we had a great evening. Uh, we can give a, a good report from that. It was just, I think, encouraging, at least it was for me, to just be doing something again. It felt like it had been too long. Uh, and so just to see the kids there and be teaching and memorizing verses, it was great. Uh, and then yesterday we had our youth group kickoff. We had a pool party, uh, which was a great time. And uh, so this Friday night, for those in grades 7 to 12, uh, is our first regular youth night. Uh, and so we look forward to that starting up. We had 15 kids at our pool party yesterday as well. So uh, we have a good number of people coming out to things. It's very exciting. The psalmist writes in Psalm 84, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, even ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, it will make a place of springs. The early rains also cover it with pools, and they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. We're thankful this morning, Father, that we can be in your presence. We would rather be here than in the tents of wickedness. We would rather be here in your presence than any other place this morning. I pray that's the truth in our hearts. We would ask that you would draw us close to yourself today. As we sing song, songs of hymn and hymns of praise and thanks, 
we would ask that you would attune our hearts once more to the things that please you. Help us to be filled with the Spirit of God this morning, that we might hear the Word of God from the Spirit. As you speak to us, speak to us in a way that would cause us to yearn to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray for those who are unable to be with us this morning, that you would watch over them and care for them. We ask, Lord, for those who have lost loved ones recently, we would ask that you would bring comfort and care, er, comforting and uh, peace to their hearts. We pray, Father, now for our time here this morning, we would ask that you would raise our spirits up through the songs that we sing, for we sing unto a God who hears and cares and loves us to the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. please and turn them to Acts chapter 1 as we finish off that chapter this morning uh, entitled this message the days of preparation which they were for the early church and they are still for us today Acts chapter 1 please follow as I read verses 12 through the end of the chapter Acts chapter 1 then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount of called Olivet which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the, spirit, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be none to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us, accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Well, one pastor author begins his commentary by saying, The Acts of the Apostles tells the story of the beginning of the new age, the age of the Spirit. This is the last age, the last chapter, so to speak, of God's work of salvation. This age will continue until the return of Jesus the King, and that is the big picture of Acts. And during his, 40, his last 40 days on earth, Jesus continued to prepare his followers for the work of taking the gospel to the world. So in verse 12, we have the disciples returning to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Very quickly, Mount of Olives is probably most famously remembered in Matthew 24 as being the place where Jesus talked about his second coming and about uh, future things and about the destruction of the temple. Zechariah also describes the Mount of Olives as being the place where Christ would return to judge the nations. And it reads in Zechariah 14:4, On the day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall be moved northward and another half southward. And I, I couldn't picture in a sense what that, what that really meant until I saw recently, I think it was National Geographic in Ethiopia, was showing this new rift that has been created in Africa where it's literally the land is moving apart from each other over a period of time. And I thought... Well, that's not going to take any time at all. When the Lord comes back, that mountain's going to go whoosh, and just make the pathway for the Lord to get in Jerusalem. But that's exciting. That's to know about the Mount of Olives. 
And their walk back from Jerusalem was within the allowed Sabbath day's journey. In other words, it was a, probably about a 15-minute walk or less than a kilometer. And um, in the Old Testament, uh, they used to measure it by cubits, and, and uh, there were certain distances in the Old Testament for things. But it was never a requirement in the law that that's as far as you could travel on a Sabbath day. But that's what became the law at that time. What we do know for sure is that the disciples, after watching the ascension of Christ, came back to Jerusalem and went to the upper room, and they were filled with great joy. We know that the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, uh, and it was held 50 days after Passover. Some people ask, in a sense, why we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. Well, the Spirit of God came on a Sunday, which was seven, 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 sevens. 49 plus 1, which is the day of Pentecost. And oftentimes we recognize that as being the day when the church began. The Lord was taken back to heaven 40 days after the resurrection, at the pass, after the Passover. And so there remained a 10-day period, which is what we're discussing at the end of Acts chapter 1 here. The Feast of Weeks was that time when the first harvest was brought in. And it was given as a thanksgiving offering to the Lord, first of all for the harvest. And then it was given as an act of faith, understanding that, by giving the Lord the first fruits, we're trusting him to provide more. So the principle of giving to the Lord first is, is an Old Testament principle that carried on into the beginning of the new church. And that's for us today, too, to remember. We give to the Lord in faithfulness because he's asked us to, believing that he will provide still what we need. So as the gospel continued to spread, the early church would have recognized the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, all the sheaves that were coming in were just a foretaste of what the Lord was to do as the gospel went throughout the whole world, many more people over time coming to know him. But in the very beginning of, of this new age, while they waited in Jerusalem, they could only know that Jesus was gone and they were to wait for the Spirit to come. So it was a time of preparation. You can see in your notes there was a similar time in the book of Joshua when Joshua and the people crossed the Jordan River. They were in the new land and they were ready to move out and do something, but God said, wait. You need some preparation time. So in Joshua chapter 5, they rested for four days. In a similar way, this 10-day waiting period was used by the Lord to prepare themselves for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Boyce, James Boyce says, we are people of action. So we expect action immediately. The Holy Spirit should come at once. The gospel should be preached right away. And instead, we find delay. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but we, we have these delays in our life and they frustrate us sometimes. We don't see things happening as quickly as we want them to be. Or we don't make the connections or we miss the connections between what we're experiencing and what God is doing. And we want to be active sometimes in doing something and we want God to be seen as being active in doing something. And yet we find these periods of seeming activity very difficult. But we need to remember that during these times, God is never inactive. God is always at work around us. But God purposely designs these times, I believe, for our sake often because we need some more preparation for what is to come. Sometimes we can see God, what God is doing, how he brings people together, how he introduces new people into our lives. A ministry comes together perhaps from a, a seed of a thought that you had planted some time ago or a relationship develops that you've been praying for over time. But sometimes we can't see what God is doing. And during those times when we're unable to understand or, or gain perspective, we have to believe that God could very well be developing us. Instead of moving us forward, there are some things that need to be developed in our own life so that we can be better prepared to serve him in the future or to minister for him. Our faith, our vision, our trust, our ability to maintain our obedience for the long haul, because only God knows what's just around the corner. He knew what the Israelites were going to face in the, in the promised land. He knew that they needed just a short time of preparation to, to prepare themselves for what God had in store. And so the early church has these 10 days between the ascension of our Lord and the coming of the Spirit of God, days of preparation. Well, at, at first glance, it may seem that these 10 days were days of inactivity, but just the opposite was true. First of all, in this time of preparation, it was a time of obedience. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, they were where Jesus told them to be. 
They were following through on his instructions. You can read back as you reflect on chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus said, after I go, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to stay there. You ever uh, had to tell your child, go to your room and stay there until what? You get further information or you get permission to move forward. This is a time of preparation for the early church. You might argue, well, where, what else were they going to do? Or where else were they going to go? Well, there was plenty of things they could have done. Like their reaction at the cross, they could have scattered again. They could have lost faith very quickly and thought, he's not here now, what do we do? The disciples had gone before, even while with Jesus. They, they were arguing about uh, who was the greatest among them. You remember that? Uh, even while they were with the Lord, they could have started arguing. They could have started planning what they were going to do next, to form a think tank, plan a strategy session. We all like to put our heads together at different times and come up with ideas of what, should, what we should be doing. Perhaps some of them started thinking, well, how, how am I going to make a living now? How is this going to work? Who's going to feed me? Who's going to pay my bills? They could have reasoned that doing was more important than waiting. And they could have started witnessing, going out as they had before. But Jesus said to stay in Jerusalem and wait. And there's good biblical precedent to see sometimes our quiet days, again, as preparation days, as God continues to do what only he can do in our hearts to prepare us for what is coming. It may seem at times there's nothing happening, that you're stuck on one spot and you can't get off of it, but in your times of preparation, know that you can still use your time wisely. You can still improve your opportunities and connections with people in your workplace or in your neighborhood. You can still, even in these quiet times, improves your, improve the relationships that you have. You can always continue in anticipation that God has something in store for you that he hasn't revealed to you yet. It was a day of disobedience and we can always be in anticipation for God to be preparing us for what is to come for future work or service or future persecution or suffering do we know what's going to happen tomorrow no idea God could work a miracle we could get a new government <laughs> or he could give us the same old government and we have to be facing the the fact that we'd still have to continue on and do what he's asked us to do in this time of preparation, it was not only a time of obedience, but it was also, for the early church, a time of fellowship. Verse 14 says, they were all with one accord together. The, the togetherness, the unity aspect is being emphasized in this passage. And what an exciting time it was for the church. Uh, just think for a moment about who was in that room. We simply don't know for sure who was there, but what about Nicodemus? He could be there. What about Joseph of Arimathea? What stories they could share? What about Mary, Martha? After all, who, was, who would be in the kitchen better than Martha? And what about Lazarus? I wonder how many times he had to answer the question, what was it like to be dead? What about the folks that Jesus had healed, the ones he taught, the ones he'd fed? So some of the 72 that had been sent out earlier might be there. And remember, of course, there were 11 very obstinate at times, strong-willed men who'd argued who was the greatest, who would refuse to watch other, others' feet, who had shoon away the children because they weren't important. And these men had had their hearts changed and reformed by the Lord as well. And along with Jesus' own brothers, we recognize that Jesus had at least four brothers and a number of unknown sisters, according to Mark 6. They'd initially rejected his messiahship, but now they were there in that mix of the rich and the poor, the educated and the, and the simple tradesmen and, and those who hadn't been educated. No doubt there was a, a real mix of people as this church began. And yet they were all together, the Lord says, in unity. And the fellowship they had undoubtedly combined with their initial joy and with a great sense of expectancy and excitement, it would have been hard perhaps at times to hear each other think and to speak as they were all anticipating what would come next. But they were also in the upper room for the purpose of preparing for the coming of the Spirit. Undoubtedly, they were excited about the fact that Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit would come, but what would it look like? What would happen? What would happen to them? This was the beginning group that God used to change the world. People in general are designed by God to need other people. Christians as well are designed by God to need other Christians. When you become a Christian, you're never called into a solo ministry or to live an isolated lifestyle. But God placed each believer into the family of God. We are all sheep in the shepherd's flock. 
We are all living stones in the building that God has created called the church. We are all vital members of his body, and we have been directed to be a part of the fellowship that he has created with believers all around the world. Christians need other Christians. And part of all, part of our calling, and I'm speaking in a sense to the choir this morning, is to find a group of like-minded believers and join them in worship, in praise, in prayer, in thanksgiving, in service, in ministry, in witness, and disciple-making. You cannot say, no matter how try hard you try to convince yourself or anyone else, that you're just fine or spiritually okay with just God and me. Or I don't need the church. I can get by on my own. Or Sunday is enough. I know that COVID has, uh, all the rules and regulations have really thrown us for a loop. And it's made us tough at times to do what we've been called to do. But we cannot say this morning that unless we have made a a genuine effort to stay connected that we are in fellowship with the Lord if we are not in fellowship with other believers. It's as simple as that. Have you done your part in these difficult days to stay connected with other believers, not just Sunday mornings, but through the week? Have you made calls and texts and, and made an effort to keep up the fellowship with others? Some people say, well, I don't like Zoom doing too much on zoom well i don't like zoom either sometimes mine doesn't work as those on the mission committee and council will know but we use what we have to stay connected think of those believers in other countries who don't even have zoom and yet they find a way to have fellowship why because the early church recognized days of preparation for what was to come days of fellowship are absolutely important for all of us they didn't know what was to come nor do we in our generation but we know that fellowship is something we must do. It was a time also of prayer. In verse 14, they were with, all, with one accord devoting themselves to prayer. It was a time of praying together. It was the third thing that was keeping them together. Notice they were constantly in prayer. They were devoting themselves to prayer. A.T. Robertson writes in his Greek word pictures, he says, they were stuck on praying. They had a commitment to pray, sometimes in the temple, and sometimes in the upper room. It doesn't mean they didn't do anything else. Some people say, think for, for 10 days all they did was pray. Well, it doesn't mean necessarily that they didn't eat or, or sleep. Uh, they had other commitments perhaps, but they were, had a commitment to each other to be continually in prayer, in a prayer attitude. Well, what did they pray for? What did they pray about? Can I, can I suggest because we're in the book of Acts, perhaps they prayed the acrostic Acts. I mean, that's too simple, but they probably had times of adoration. The Lord had been working in their midst in a wonderful way. The Lord had loved them to the end. And thinking back over their past three years and thinking back over our last even year and a half, would we not be able to come up with some things as we did this morning to thank God for, to praise him for, for his love and for his faithfulness, his grace, his mercy, his wisdom, his power, the salvation that he has provided for us? The early church probably spent some of these 10 days in adoration. But they also probably spent some time in confession. And we all need to get better at confession, to being honest and humble before the Lord. But Paul says in Colossians 3, 3, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Peter was part of this group. Do you think he remembered his denials of the Lord? Thomas was in, his, in this group. Do you think Thomas remembered how he disbelieved that uh, Jesus was uh, raised from the dead? Others had fled from the Lord at the cross, and the Scripture doesn't tell us exactly what they did, but they all ran for cover. They left for Jesus alone. I, I wonder if they confessed that to one another. James 5, 16, confess your faults to one another and be healed. They probably had some time of confession. They probably wondered, how can we be witnesses for the Lord when it was so easy for us to run away? They probably had some time to confess their sins. And we would have to ask ourselves this morning as individuals, is there any sin that I need to confess this morning? That I need to get right with God? If I harbor or, 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 or hold tight sin within my heart, Psalm 66, 18, the Lord will not hear me. Is there a need for me to come clean or you to come clean before the Lord today? It was part of the early church as they met together, they prayed. They probably had time of thanksgiving as well for God forgiving them of their sins, for his grace and mercy towards them. Remember how the 
the disciples wanted to bring down fire on people they didn't like or didn't like Jesus. And they wanted to, to send away the children and they, they just didn't have a lot of mercy and grace themselves. But they were thankful that God was changing their hearts. Thankful to the Lord for what he had taught them and how he had restored them to ministry. And finally, they probably had a time of supplication. They would have had maybe a heaviness on their hearts about how were we going to accomplish this task that we have been given to reach the world for Jesus Christ. And that's the same task that we have. Is it ever heavy on our hearts as to what the Lord, what does the Lord want us to do? How are we going to fulfill our calling? No doubt the, the heaviness on their hearts was uh, their awareness of their own inadequacies for the task. Lord, help us. I, I think that's probably the prayer that sticks out in my mind the most where uh, Peter's jumped out of the boat, he's walking to the Lord, he begins to sink, and he just says, Lord, help. And I think sometimes we start sinking and we forget to say, help. Or maybe that's the time when we remember, Lord, help. They might have prayed for the lost to be found. They might have prayed for the prodigals to come home. They might have prayed for the lukewarm to become useful once again. They might have prayed for those who had lost their first love, like, like they had, that they would find him once again. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, he probably gives a summary thought of how the, the early church was feeling. Who is sufficient for these things? Well, fourthly, it was also a time for study. Now, just a quick note on verses 18 and 9, which are most likely a parenthesis in the middle of P Peter's speech here. Luke does this often in his writings, where he says something, and then he puts in a little note of explanation, because he's writing to Gentiles, uh, we believe, that they don't have the same Jewish background or understanding of things that he might have been saying. So here he gives a little, a brief summary of, of why we're, we're talking about Judas here and why there is a need for this new leadership and, to ex and, 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 and so uh, Luke is very clear here that what Ju Judas did was because of the wickedness of his own heart. Some people try to excuse Judas and say, well, he didn't have a choice that God had pre-planned for him to, uh, to deny the Lord right from the beginning of time. And Judas was, you know, he should be excused for what he did. Luke makes it very clear that Judas chose to do what he did because of the sinfulness and wickedness in his own heart. Matthew's focus on Judas' death was a suicide. Luke's highlight was that his death was as a punishment for his sins. Luke received his inheritance, one writer says, of 30 pieces of silver by denying and betraying Jesus. He gave up everything for a few pieces of silver only to find out in the end that he lost the money, he lost the field, and ultimately he had lost his life. But as Peter in verse 15 begins to speak, he quoted scripture. He quoted, he quoted Psalm 69 verse 25 and then Psalm 109 verse 8. The, the justification for replacing Judas was on the basis of Old Testament scripture. Now, the passages that he used were people that were against David and how they were treating David. But Peter sees in this passage, and I believe through the insights that the Lord had given to him, and then when the Spirit of God was given to them, later in Acts, but also, if you read in the upper room, Jesus had breathed the Spirit of God onto these individuals. They had deeper insights than we might have. Initially, when Jesus met with them, he opened up their hearts, Luke 24, and opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And so I think as Peter and the 12, or as Peter and the other 11, uh, began to study the Word of God during this time, things would have come back to their mind, understanding would have come to them, during this period because the Lord had taught them, the Lord had promised them that he would give them understanding. We talked a little bit about that last week. So although we may find it difficult to understand how Peter would choose these two particular verses to justify the calling of a replacement for Judas, I believe we can see the Lord's instruction and direction in the choosing of these verses. Including the time that we, they were with Jesus, they began to search the scriptures more diligently and understand things more deeply. Um, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And then John 2, 22 says, When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So, 
beginning with the resurrection and the ascension, the disciples began to put things together. They put two and two together and realized that what Jesus said and what the Old Testament said, it all comes together in an understanding way for them. There are two activities that are most important in the Christian life, activities that we never outgrow, and one is prayer and one is Bible study. When we pray, we talk to God. When we study the Bible, God talks to us. us. And someone has wisely stated then, and I agree, that we should spend more time listening than talking, which means we need to be students of the Word of God and to listen to what God is saying so that it would direct our prayers. We need to let God do most of the talking. We want God to bless us, to bless our church, bless our family, bless our small groups. But if we're serious about this wanting a blessing from God, we need to recognize what the early church did. And they took time, not just in these days of preparation, but later on we can see that even those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, Thessalonica because they searched the word daily. We need to respond what God teach, we, we need to respond to what God teaches us to apply it to our lives. We need to recognize our responsibility to believe it, to share it, to connect the spiritual dots and see what God is doing in our lives. That means we've got to be students of the word, not just on Wednesday nights at Awana, but all through the week. We need to study and show ourselves approved unto God. It was a time of preparation, and during that time, the early church obeyed. They had fellowship together, they prayed, they studied the word of God. And then fifthly in this passage and finally there was a confirmation of new leadership. The last thing we read about in this chapter was that the disciples uh, recognized and they needed a new leader from their midst. And in, in a summary, Matthias was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot. Some have disagreed with the disciples' decision at this point to, to select Matthias, sometimes um, they say, well, we don't hear anything more about Matthias in the scriptures. Therefore, he was, he was a mistake, and we should have waited until the apostle, or they should have waited until the apostle Paul. Well, the trouble is, we only hear from three of the, the 11 or 12 apostles for the rest of the book anyway, Peter, James, and John. And so what happened to Thomas? What happened to, Math uh, to uh, Bartholomew? And well, that's not a good reason not to accept Matthias. Some others disagree by the fact that they chose uh, him by lots. And it sounds too much like uh, drawing straws or flipping a coin or rolling the dice. It's too pagan a move. And there's a disagreement there. And I'll address that in a minute. But there's much more on leadership to come. But here in this passage, even we can recognize that in choosing the leadership of the church, first of all, they had a general understanding of the principles of the word of God. That's where they started. What does God say to us? What does God require from us? This was a time to study the word of God. Tony Murata writes, Like the disciples, we too at times will struggle to comprehend the plan and sovereignty of God in our world and in our lives. We will ponder the prosperity of the wicked and suffering of the righteous, and we will wrestle with the setbacks of life and with the affirming the sovereignty of God. Yet, like Peter, we should look to the scriptures to make sense of our world and our lives, for in the scriptures we will continually rediscover perspective, truth, instruction, and the beauty of our Savior. And that's where the disciples and the 120 began in their selection of the new leadership. They began in the Word of God. Secondly, I su may I suggest that there was some sanctified common sense that accompanied, accompanied the study. Now you're saying, where in the world do you get that in the text? That's verse 12b. No, it's, it's, it, we just understand that God has given us According to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul, Paul says we have the mind of Christ. So when we get saved, we have a new capacity and a new ability through the Spirit of God now to understand spiritual things. It's reasonable for us to assume that God can guide us as we study the scriptures and put two and two together with the principles that he's given to us along with the negative and positive commands and the guidelines that we have that we can make sense of the scripture. John MacArthur writes, as Christians, God instructs us. We are able to understand all things of his word because we have the mind of Christ. Christ thinks God's thoughts, understand God's wisdom, so we have his mind. This term transla is translated understanding in other passages, and its usage may be best understood from in Luke 24, 45, when it says Jesus had opened their minds to understand or to know the scriptures. 
The doctrine of illumination here does not mean that we can know and understand everything, that we have no more need for human teachers or that study is not hard work. However, it does mean that scripture can be understood by every Christian who is diligent and obedient. Read the scriptures, you study the scriptures, it's God speaking to us, what is he saying? Based on the mind of Christ that we have that's been transformed as we look into the word of God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can put together two and two oftentimes and come up with a reasonable understanding of what God wants us to do. But thirdly, notice they still prayed. They prayed with understanding. They prayed for understanding. Based on the word of God and their sanctified reasoning, they combined what they already knew with the mind of Christ had given to them. But even like Samuel, even with understanding the scriptures, even being a prophet of God as Samuel was, he recognized that he couldn't always see as God saw. Because God sees the heart. So the early church recognized as much as they understood the word of God and as much as they were able with the mind of Christ to put two things together, they still needed to be directed by the spirit of God to see things as God sees them. There was still a need for prayer. We think sometimes, well, God's going to do whatever he's going to do anyway. Why pray? No, the early church recognized the importance and essentiality of, the, essentiality of prayer in their lives. And then after all of that, they threw the dice. <laughs> John Stott says, believing that, and trusting that Jesus would make his choice known. Now, casting of the lots. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. This is not casting of the lottery. This is not an encouragement to buy tickets in the lottery. Just the opposite. But it wasn't accepted Old, tradition, Old Testament tradition and practice. It was often used in the Old Testament to determine God's will. The Lord used lots with Israel in the division of the promised land. He used lots in the dividing of various assignments to those who would serve in the sanctuary. Haman in Esther was going to use lots to decide uh, on the date that he was going to kill all the Jews. Matthew 27, 35 says the soldiers at the cross cast lots to divide up Jesus' garments. Jonah, remember that? They all cast lots to find out who was guilty of the storm and that came out that Jonah was. Was that right? Yeah, that was true. The Lord guarded their tossing or their, their casting of the dice and Jonah was thrown overboard because of the lots. Proverbs 16, 33 says the lot or the dice, we might say the flipping of the coin, so to speak, is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Is the Lord able to control that, that flip and that dice and, and so on? to make his will known of course he was and they trusted that in the old testament now finally notice that the the use of lots doesn't appear in the scriptures again after this point after the coming of the spirit of god there's no further instruction by new testament writers on how to use lots or why to cast lots and what kind of lots you should use and so can lots and dice be used today to determine god's will it just doesn't seem real high on his list of instructions for the new testament church However, I suppose we can't rule it out completely in really uncertain times, but I shouldn't use it as my go-to solution for every decision that I have to make. Okay, Lord, which, which route am I going to take to church today? Cast the dice. But can they be used? Uh, the jury is still out. But John says, or... or uh, Luke says, as we trust in God's sovereignty and his ability to guide us today, we use his word. We use the mind that we have in Christ. We make a decision, we pray, and we go with it. We move forward as the Lord directs. John Sott then writes, the stage is now set for the day of Pentecost. The apostles have received Christ's commission. They've seen his ascension. The apostolic team is complete again, ready to be his chosen witnesses. Only one thing is missing. The Spirit has not yet come. Though the place left vacant by Judas has been filled with Matthias, the place left vacant by Jesus has not yet been filled by the Spirit. So we leave Luke's first chapter of the Acts with 120 waiting in Jerusalem, persevering in prayer with one heart and one mind, ready to, to fulfill Christ's command just as soon 
as he has fulfilled his promise. So the question remains as we close this morning. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Am I prepared for what's coming next? And during this time of preparation for what's coming next, and we don't know what's coming next, do we? Do any of us know what's coming next? No. But it should be for all of us a time of obedience, to obey what we already know is true in Scripture. We don't have to look for a lot of further information or instruction. We have it in the Word of God. We need to have this time of preparation. We need to have fellowship with one, or one another. And Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 comes into play. And, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We don't know what the future holds for us here, but we do know Christ is coming back, don't we? We need to be preparing for that. We need a time of prayer. We can't say it or emphasize it or stress it enough. We know what we need to do in this area. We need to pray individually, and we need to pray together. Are we doing enough of that? I don't think so. I can't answer for individually, but I know corporately we're not praying enough together. Now, again, COVID's messed us all up. But when we have times for opportunity to pray together, do you take it up? And we need to study the, the word of God. James Boyce writes that even in his own church, <laughs> he was getting ready to prepare a message, and he read his own church bulletin at that particular time, and he noticed a little heading, small groups. And it said, through prayer, the study of God's word, and mutual sharing, these small groups provide fellowship and support that are not found anywhere else. And he thought, that's it. It's not just a time of Bible study, but it's a time of fellowship and prayer in a small group together is what we need. It's what we all need. We need to make sacrifices to make those things happen, if we can. And it's a time to confirm our leadership. There's much more, as I said, on church leadership to come in the book of Acts. But even based on Acts 1, I believe we need to pray for we need to encourage, we need to support our current leaders, all the leaders in all areas of ministry. How you do that, let the Lord guide you and direct you. But we also need all of our current leadership in every area of ministry to remain faithful to their commitments and to serve the Lord in their positions. Well, we're in a time of preparation at FFBC. We're in a time of preparation in Canada, perhaps around the world for what's coming next. We know the Lord can come, but we don't know when. The early church knew the Holy Spirit was coming, and yet there was still so much unknown, and that's why they prepared. Are you ready for what God has in store for us today? Are you doing any preparation to get, in, to get ready for what God might have in store for you tomorrow? Pray for this church family, for our current leadership, our trustees, our deacons, a council, a want leadership, small group leadership, music, and youth. We don't want to be left behind when God begins to move, we don't want to be left out of his blessings, do we? Use this time to prepare for what God has coming. Dear Heavenly Father, we would ask in closing that you would forgive us for being content with our own resources. Forgive us for our own lack of preparation at times to serve you more faithfully and more fully. Help us to recognize just how poor and empty we can become without the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, and without prayer, and without the study of the Word. We pray for the Spirit of God to re-empower us in our hearts and our minds today. We pray expecting that once we ask, and that once we seek, and that once we knock, you will answer, and provide for us what we need in this moment, in this hour. Help us to move forward from this time in the anticipation that you desire to do great things through this church, and through everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Guide us. Teach us, convict us, confront us, challenge us, and fill us with your spirit to empower us for service today and for each of our tomorrows until you come again. In Jesus' name, amen.